Ladies and gentlemen, may I first express my sincere thanks for the generous invitation to present this opening talk for this somewhat unusual conference. Unusual because of its format caused by the coronavirus outbreak. However, although the format may be unusual, that cannot detract from the extreme importance of the contents of what is to follow these general opening remarks. There can be little doubt to all open-minded people that science in general, and physical science in particular, face several oft-hidden problems. Many of these, although by no means all, are involved with issues of uncertainty. And it is with this issue that the larger part of this conference will be concerned. In a totally unrelated area of physics, changes seem, just seem, to have occurred recently, which might indicate some hope that more open-mindedness has entered into that area, and therefore the possibility of a change of attitude in other spheres of endeavour might have arisen also. Just over 30 years ago, in 1988, together with a colleague, I published a letter in a well-respected journal in which the validity of the Bekenstein-Hawking expression for the entropy of a black hole was questioned. The follow-up article detailing the entire argument was, however, rejected. And subsequently, my colleague and I encountered real difficulties in having articles accepted for publication in frontline journals. However, 30 years later, shortly after Hawking's death, I was contacted by that same original journal to referee an article. I did so as much out of curiosity as anything and found it to be a piece of work dealing amongst other things with the aforementioned entropy expression. Consequently, I criticized the submitted article in my report, not out of any sense of pique, because, but because I genuinely believed it to be incorrect. The article was rejected for publication. Shortly afterwards, I was asked by the same journal to referee another paper on a totally different topic. Again, I did so, and my recommendations were accepted and followed through exactly. But that wasn't the end of the story. A few months later, the parent body sent me an award as a referee of the year. Now, was it a coincidence that after 30 years, but following Hawking's death, I seemed to have been accepted back into the fold? I accept that all this could be an almost unbelievable coincidence. But is it just possible that it is actually an indicator of a change of philosophy of at least some in the hierarchy that appears to control so much in the physics community? If it is, now could well be exactly the right time to push for a true open-minded examination of at least some of the major problems facing modern day science and which are the fundamental topics of this conference. Now, the question of uncertainty affects many areas, including my own special interest of thermodynamics, although in that case, the effect may be felt indirect. But for a moment, consider the situation in thermodynamics. In traditional classical thermodynamics, there are no uncertainties. All the variables, such as the internal energy, total number of particles, they all possess definite values. However, when you come to consider, for example, systems of large number, numbers of particles, then the methods of statistical mechanics have to be employed due to our present state of knowledge. As a consequence, when you look at the thermodynamics of such systems, we enter the realm known as statistical thermodynamics. Now, this is in some crucial ways totally different from classical thermodynamics, because the introduction of statistical 
techniques has actually introduced an element of uncertainty into the picture. No longer are there definite values for the internal energy or total number of particles. Rather, average values are considered. These average values, as with the average values of other thermodynamic variables, can fluctuate in this new regime. Hence, a degree of uncertainty is introduced, which leads to the derivation of thermodynamic uncertainty relations. It's important to realize, though, that these relations have been introduced via the recourse to statistical methods to describe details of the systems under consideration. They have been introduced because in a system composed of a large number of particles, it's simply not possible to write down all the equations of motion of the individual particles, let alone solve the resulting set of simultaneous equations. The uncertainty, therefore, has been introduced as a result of our inability to solve the exact problem. There's no inherent uncertainty in the original system. And this reasoning follows for all other statistical thermodynamic theories as well, and indicates, as I've said before, a very real difference between classical and statistical thermodynamics. Again, the same reasoning may be seen to apply to many, if not all, problems considered using probability theory. For example, when probability theory is introduced to people, it's popular to consider the tossing of a coin as a typical example. But if the coin is simply tossed, the outcome when it lands, heads or tails, is totally uncertain. However, I would contend that this is not so if someone is in possession of all the initial conditions pertaining to the toss. If the initial speed is known, the height to which the coin rises may be found, as may be the time taken to reach that height. Similarly, the time taken to fall back to any given level may be found. Now, if the rate of rotation of the coin is also known, that, together with the total time of flight, should enable the state of the coin on reaching the desired final level to be ascertained exactly. Hence, the uncertainty associated with this problem really arises through a lack of knowledge of the initial conditions in the problem. It's not an inherent problem of the actual system. Now, in this sense, it follows that neither statistical thermodynamics nor probability may be termed complete theories. Since neither provides exact solutions to problems. In both, uncertainty is introduced as a result of the inability to write down and solve a set of exact equations and or a lack of knowledge of initial conditions. Now, recent reading of some books on quantum mechanics would seem to indicate a similar situation existing at that branch of physics as well. For example, in Heisenberg's well-known book, The Physical Principles of the Quantum Theory, the initial derivation of the uncertainty relations relies on a very obvious approximation, and that might in itself raise a few minor queries. But a little later, the more rigorous derivation draws on notions of probability. Indeed, the ideas of probability are very closely associated with the wave function in quantum mechanics, as we all know. But once probability enters any discussion, an element of uncertainty must follow in the subsequent theory. Hence, one must wonder if the uncertainty relations of quantum mechanics are a product of the theory rather than the natural property of the systems the theory is purporting to portray. And this, of course, is highly reminiscent of the situation encountered in statistical thermodynamics. However, the very fact that probabilistic ideas enter any subject at all must surely indicate that th that, that theory cannot be complete. Hence, the idea of a theory being complete, or here it is intended to indicate that the theory is capable of describing any 
relevant physical system exactly without any degree, however slight, of uncertainty. Now that's the idea put forward here, which may not be exactly as in the Einstein Podolsky Rosen article, but we'll come to that later. Now, some might well feel, with some justification, that some of my comments so far, if not all of them, have been a little naive, even childlike. However, I would like to remind everyone of two quotations from the Bible that might seem appropriate at this juncture. The first comes from St. Paul's Epistle to the Corinthians, the popular section involving the ideas of faith, hope, and charity. In that section, at one point, St. Paul says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, in many ways, we've all done that. But it, it seems we might also take note of one of Jesus's comments that one needs to become like a little child if one wishes to enter the kingdom of heaven. It seems to me that many scientists could benefit from contemplating these two quotes taken together. Over the years, science has become more and more dependent on more and more advanced, abstruse mathematics. And maybe all scientists should stand back a little and reflect. Rather than rushing blindly on, using methods and results authenticated by conventional wisdom, but not necessarily by common sense, maybe we should all return to some childlike thinking. Now, I'd hasten to add that I don't feel that this mild criticism applies to the methods of hadronic mechanics. Although there is a huge amount of new mathematics to absorb in that field, when you become used to the new notation, the mathematics is not too difficult to understand. Unlike some of the modern additions to accepted conventional theory, several of which seem to be attempting to transport us to some mythical land of make-believe, at least in my view. As far as the einstein podolsky rosen or EPR ideas are concerned. It's worth noting that questions about the completeness of quantum mechanics as a physical theory have been discussed at great length ever since that famous, or well, some might say infamous, infamous paper first appeared. Many experiments were carried out in attempts to both prove and disprove the assertions contained therein. And a great deal of thought went into the theoretical investigations of such as Bell. It's interesting, though, that all Bell's work has been collected together. All his papers on quantum philosophy have been collected together and published in an actual book, Speakable and Unspeakable in Quantum Mechanics. But less well known is the resolution of the paradox advanced by Santilli in 1998. And it's the lack of publicity for the, this resolution of the paradox that poses a significant question for the scientific community. Although, when you read just the abstract for that paper, maybe some answers become apparent. With talk of such concepts as nonlinear, non-local, non-canonical axiom-preserving isotopies and spin isospin symmetry, and ISO spaces, some will be put off by the implied effort to understand properly what follows in the body of the paper, while others will dismiss the work out of hand because it depends crucially on concepts unfamiliar to them, not for any other reason. Now, this may be a totally improper attitude towards proposed new science, but many will have forged impressive curricula vitae based on what they regard as well-established concepts and procedures, and be, will be very reluctant to jeopardize their personal positions. Hence the huge question for the scientific community. When do we agree to examine 
with a truly open mind, radical new proposals for help in solving age old problems. It seems there was no difficulty in examining and accepting a wide range of results from Riemannian geometry, as well as the uncertainties of introduced by quantum mechanics into physics and chemistry some 100 years ago. So why not afford the same respect to hadronic mechanics? Or are the fundamental results of quantum mechanics to remain sacrosanct, even when they don't answer all the important questions facing the scientific community? I think that a very important and very serious question. Now, these are vitally important questions in general, but are particularly apposite when considering the so-called EPR paradox and work related to it. Basically, the EPR claims that quantum mechanics is an incomplete theory because its description of physical reality does not include all elements of reality. While every element of physical reality should be precisely represented in a complete theory. Santilli's new approach has important consequences as far as the EPR argument is concerned. Traditionally, commuting quantities are believed to be independent. But in the so-called isotopic completion of quantum mechanics, isocommuting quantities can be mutually interacting. Although it should be understood that such interactions are structurally different from those of action at a distance or potential type. Fundamentally, quantum mechanics may be considered an incomplete theory in that it does not contain the element of reality given by the non local structure of interactions expected from the mutual wave overlapping. Put simply, hadronic mechanics overcomes this problem. However, it is important to realize that, as Santilli himself points out, hadronic mechanics is not intended to represent all elements of reality. It is not meant to be a final theory. Physics is, after all, a discipline which will never admit final theories. Hadronic mechanics simply provides one type of completion of quantum mechanics, that of axiom-preserving type. You might note also at this point that Santilli has also shown via his new mathematics that von Neumann's theorem on hidden variables is quite simply inapplicable under isotopies. Note, not violated, just inapplicable. And he's also shown that the oft-quoted Bell's inequality is not valid universally, but holds for the conventional form of quantum mechanics specifically. Recently, this whole matter has resurfaced with the announcement of experimental results supporting the EPR assertions at Basel. And this has provoked further contemplation of this whole issue of completeness and just what it means. The Basel team noted that the phenomenon dated back to a thought experiment of 1935, and it allowed measurements, or it allowed measurement results to be predict predicted precisely. But it must be remembered always that thought experiments are just that, thought experiments. And such are very difficult to interpret due to the assumptions made not always being totally clear, possibly not even to the originators themselves. In fact, in a purely thought experiment, it is easy to imagine a situation where a fundamental assumption is made with no one realizing that has occurred. Remember, we all indulge in thought experiments, some even when we're asleep. How many of us have woken up thinking we've got a solution to a problem? Only for our thoughts, to be, those initial feelings of euphoria to be dashed when we started to write things down. Because the true validity of these thoughts that we maybe come across in our sleep, 
They only become apparent when we commit them to paper and the resulting concrete scrutiny. Now, supposedly, the essence of a good practical experiment is that it should be readily repeatable. Now, it's relatively easy to see how this could be true, but could equally well be untrue of any thought experiment. Hence, in my personal view, important results derived by a thought experiment should always be treated with extreme care. Nevertheless, as far as the thought experiment leading to the EPR paradox is concerned, it is one that has been viewed and examined over a huge number of years and seemingly has always led to a paradox in physics. Because basically, via a thought experiment, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen showed that predictions are possible theoretically in certain circumstances. Briefly, such a notion may be explained as follows. They considered two systems in an entangled state in which their properties are strongly correlated. In this case, the results of measurements on one system may be used to predict the results of corresponding measurements on the second system with, in principle, arbitrary precision. It was also the case that the two systems could be separated spati spatially. The resulting paradox is that an observer may use measurements on the first system to make precise statements about the second system. And those statements could be more precise than those made by an observer who has direct access to the second system, but not the first. Now, the Basel team used lasers to cool atoms to a small fraction of a degree above absolute zero. And at such low, low temperatures, the atoms are thought to behave completely according to the rules of quantum mechanics and form a Bose-Einstein condensate. In this ultra-cold cloud, the atoms collide with one another constantly, causing their spins to become entangled. The researchers involved then took measurements of the spin in spatially separated regions of the condensate. By using high resolution imaging, they were able to measure the spin correlations between the separate regions directly and simultaneously localize the atoms in precisely defined positions. Hence, in this experiment, the researchers seem to have succeeded in using measurements in a given region to predict precisely the results for another region. Now, experimental physics is certainly not my forte. In fact, I've not been directly involved in that area at all since my undergraduate days. So firstly, I'm in no position to comment on the validity of the experimentation concerned here. Secondly, I don't know if any serious objections to this work by the Basel team have surfaced since I read their claims. If such have emerged, the argument over the validity of the EPR paradox will no doubt rumble on. If none has or does emerge, then it's conceivable that a new era for physics might be opening up. Since it is surely the case that applications will follow, which we all hope will be of benefit to mankind, rather than the reverse. Now, as a quick follow up to these comments, it might be worth raising the question of the presumed boundary between classical and quantum mechanics. Precisely when is something small enough to warrant the use of quantum mechanics to describe it? Is this boundary clear cut? Or does the transition evolve over what might be thought of as a blurred region in which either or both apply? I confess this seemingly simple point is one I've never seen discussed, but is one that's preyed on my mind for years with no apparent resolution in the offing. It might be wondered if the reintroduction of an ether could help in the resolution of this and possibly many other difficulties encountered in modern physics. For example, the uncertainty in the position and speed of a very small particle could be accounted for by the presence of a boundary layer between the said small particle and the ether. It's certain that if the existence of an ether is true, then such a boundary layer must exist. 
and if the ideas put forward by Kenneth Thornhill, Thornhill concerning an ether are valid, then the size of ether particles would be extremely small, and extremely small in comparison with the size of recognized elementary particles. Obviously, this situation wouldn't apply so obviously um, with the size of um, or to macroscopic bodies, because their individual size would far outweigh that of the proposed ether particles. The notion of reintroducing the idea of an ether receives some support these days with a renewed interest in some quarters in the work of Nikola Tesla. His writings, as well as those of myriad major scientists working on problems of, or at least involving electromagnetic ideas towards the end of the 19th century, contain constant references to this medium. It seems we should all be approaching problems with much more open minds and not be guided too rigidly by convention, conventional wisdom. As the saying goes, think outside the box. These latter points are all purely speculative, but nevertheless, thoughts which have materialized over years and lead to questions at least which I feel need carefully considered answers in order to serve the cause of the advancement of scientific knowledge well. At this point, at the very beginning of this conference, it might be remembered also that this event, which could prove vitally important to the future in physical science, has come about due to one person, Ruggiero Santilli. Most of us know the, the enormous contribution he's made, a contribution far too extensive to even begin to summarize here. But I feel forced to mention one example that's been totally ignored. Amongst other things, other applications that have come out of his work, he put forward a proposal quite some years ago now for a safe method for disposing of nuclear waste. In order to check out this proposal, it was going to be necessary to carry out roughly three quite small experiments. Request after request was made that these should be carried out independently. In fact, in 2008, in the conference at Monza, I myself drew attention to this in front of an audience which included, amongst other people, the European Commissioner um, dealing with energy matters. Nothing happened. And this is just one example, one that could prove really costly for mankind. But before closing, I'd like to draw attention to one other small point concerning Ruggiero Santilli. It's a very small but significant point he raised many years ago. Earlier, I drew attention to the difficulty all must experience in thought experiments in remaining totally aware of any and all assumptions made at the outset. As I said also, when one comes to write down thoughts on paper, the assumptions made and their consequences be become somewhat clearer, but they may never be forgotten. Now, when Einstein proposed his special theory of relativity many years ago, he made an assumption concerning the constancy of the speed of light. Today, it is commonplace in the media, but also in scientific circles, to hear people claim that Einstein said the speed of light is constant. In fact, it's almost a basic statement of modern physics to some. All have forgotten that as Ruggiero Santilli pointed out so clearly several years ago, Einstein's assumption was that the speed of light remained constant in a vacuum. And here Ruggiero stressed by a popular example of vitally important scientific truth. When you were using or quoting a previously derived result in science, check diligently to see what precise assumptions have been made in deriving the said result. Many errors could be avoided so easily if this simple procedure was adhered to strictly. Now may I close by expressing the sincere hope 
that this proves to be an enormously successful conference and one which leads to a more open-minded approach to the solution of the important problems facing 21st century science. And finally, I would like on behalf of all participating in this event to thank Ruggiero Santilli, his wife Carla, and all their colleagues working unnamed and unrecognized behind the scenes for organizing it. To all of them, thank you. And to you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you.